This episode of Legends the Series is brought to you by these fine companies. Always right at each other's throat, had the rivalry. You need that. And, you know, so many other drivers that get mad like we're picking on. Listen, we need that. The fans want to see it. We need the rivalries, you know. I mean, it's just the way it is. I'm not going to change. You can forget that. I think everybody knows that. I'm never going to change. If I got something to say, I'm going to say it. And if you don't want to hear it, don't ask me. What's Pat's speed shop? Well, as my speed shop started, we've been, it'll be 50 years now, started in 1970. What are we looking at here? That's my B modified car. I had a 55 Chevy before that, and that's, at, that's English Town. See the old 64 ambulance, and they actually had scoreboards back then. That's probably 1971 or two. Well, when I first started racing, I was a teenager. I, I actually started street racing. Lost my license and started out with a B-modified car, and then that was right at the time they started bracket racing. And I'm not a bracket racer. I'm sorry. I'm a heads-up racer. That's how we raced on the street. When I started street racing, he didn't know a thing about it. My father was a hard worker, built diners. And I had to work for him during the day, and I had a little speed shop to the side. And he'd come in there, he didn't know anything about, never was a mechanic, didn't know anything about racing. He hated it. He thought we were crazy. So I had a Corvette and I was street racing, and it was broke all the time. You know, just we'd go out to Queens and race for Saturday, Sunday, come back to work, drive the car back. And he just used to want to know why the car was broke all the time. We tried to hide it from him because we were street racing. So then I took it to the racetrack and he started getting involved. And about, I would say in less than a year, he was hooked as hard as any of us. He backed me through all my pro stock days, came with me, was right on my right side, was great. Kind of like I'm doing with Lizzie, you know, but he didn't know anything. He learned whatever I learned, you know, as we went along, but he had, you know, he believed in his son and I believed in him, you know, he came. So I, they were great days for me. But um, truthfully, a lot of guys come from racing parents. I didn't have racing parents. They thought I was nuts when I started. <laughs> So was Pat Musi a spoiled brat? I don't, you can just go look at my, I hate to say it, but I'll just say it. My assault and battery record was not good in them days. <laughs> I fought all the time, got in trouble, but I, I was in good shape. We used to carry, we call them timbers. They were four foot long, six by eight. And I carried hundreds a day because we had to move these diners on wheels. I would drive the truck as my father got older. And these units were 19 foot wide. That's two and a half lanes of the highway, 70 foot long. And I had to drive them. We'd get there four in the morning because we had to drive through the night. And I, we'd have to build what we did with the timbers is just picture this way, cribbing, we called it. So four cribs, four corners. We'd unload them timbers. I mean, I bet you I moved thousands of them in my day. So I had to work a job just like anybody. And working for my old man, I probably got fired once a week. <laughs> but he, my old man was, I mean, he's just no let up. Did he help me? Yeah, all he could. But, you know, he was just a hardworking guy, you know, did the diner deal. And, uh, yeah, did he help me? Yes, but not you know, we didn't have millions, we had thousands, you know, but uh, I worked, uh, I mean, back in those days, I could take, I remember when I was 18, 19, I could take a full-blown oxygen tank, a tall one, throw it up on my shoulder and roll with it. So, I don't think I can do it now, I'm 68, so it's a little rough right now, but yeah, I paid my dues, trust me, I'd work till 2, 3 in the morning to go racing, or work through the night, drive the rig, you know, I mean... Everybody thinks, you know, it's kind of just given to you, but trust me, I work for it. What did it mean to you as a kid coming up in here to have your dad out at the racetrack with you? 
You know, when you're a kid, you don't appreciate as much as you do as you get older. But it means the world to me now to have that time with him, you know what I'm saying? So, and he loved it. He wrote it. You'll see on some of the old videos of mine, he's standing there like I'm standing there for Lizzie now. Only difference is, I know the sport. I brought Lizzie up from the bottom, taught her how to drive. You know, he kind of learned with me, but my old man was pretty sharp now. That had to be devastating to lose him. Yeah, of course. You know, he made it to 86. And, uh, we, you know, his last year he had dementia, you know, and really didn't uh, get it. But, yeah, I miss my old man every day, you know. But we all got to go one day. Is it still tough on you sometimes to think about him not being there? Oh, uh, yeah. I got a picture on my desk and I'll look up, you know, and it's tough deal, you know, so. Could you have made it as far as you did without him? You know, who knows? I don't, you, you never know, you know, but I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, he was, he'd always push me or I'd push him or whatever. We kind of pushed each other, you know. Um, there's a period when he got older with the diners where I was actually on my own running my shop and I went over and helped him, you know, because he was getting older. I had to move all the units, like I said, drive the rig and uh, move them for him. So it kind of went this way, then went that way, you know, but he, uh, my old man was hands-on, had to do everything. As the work continues in the funny car pits, we turn our attention to Pro Stock, the finals, which match world champion Bob Flitton here in the left lane, a five-time world title holder. Little the edge is taken off this event because Lee Shepard, his arch rival, red-lighted in the quarterfinals. Flitton will be going up against Pat Busey of Carteret, New Jersey, an occasional NHRA visitor and IHRA regular. It's going to be a Ford and Chevrolet battle. Flitton in a Ford and Musey in a Chevrolet. These cars are closer to stock than any we've seen on the strip today. They're waiting for the light. They inch into the staging area, and reaction time comes into play here now, waiting for the light again. And they're off, and it's Musi ahead of Flinton at the start. Musi, but Flinton starts to power by, and it's Flinton with yet another Pomona victory. So this kid, Pat Musi out of New Jersey, he comes in there, he's full of piss and vinegar, right? Right? Okay. He's full of piss and vinegar. He's going to run pro stop. How dare he line up and threaten to kick Grumpy's ass? You know? Tell me about this kid full of piss and vinegar. Well, I'll tell you a little funny story. It got so bad. And this is a true story involves my old man. If he was here, but you know if I tell you a story, by now everybody knows it's true. We had a match race. It was me, Nicholson, Sox, Jenkins. We're all in Englishtown. Vinnie Knapp books us all in. I go 7.95 that day. Their fastest car was Nicholson, closest was 8.20. Nicholson grabbed my old man on the starting line and said, Mr. Musi. They had a lot of respect for my old man because he was, you know, back then he was, he was in his 50s, you know. He's, uh, so he said, you got to talk to your kid. He is embarrassing us. At least back it up a little bit. And my old man looked at him. He said, I don't want to tell you. I can't tell him myself. <laughs> He's gonna go as fast as that car will go, you know. So, but it, what was cool about that period for me that I'll I'll never regret. I might have you know worked hard and you know neglected some other things, you know. But uh, I got to read about Jenkins, about Nicholson when I was in high school. Read about them guys, then got to race them. And beat, you can go back and look, I beat every one of them. I beat Nicholson on a whole shot in Tucson. That is the worst, sorry, done, but it is what it is, buddy. Up there, if you can hear me. The worst sore loser I've ever raced in my life. So we're going to Pomona in 1981. You know how you just remember, my memory's so good. So we had that Mustang, you know, and we had big motors, and Pomona was going to be the little motors. So we had run in the sevens. I think he had dipped in the sevens. So I run him in the final, but it was altitude. I'm ne I know the numbers. I went 826. He went 823, and I beat him probably a half a car length at the finish line. So I just get out. You know, I knew Don. We talked before until I beat him. Then it wasn't funny no more. So I walked back there to congratulate. I said, you know, good job. He turned his back on me. I said, oh, that's how it is. Okay. 
it'll be worse the next time I don't I was like you say I was cocky you know but thank God I could back it up you know but it was it was cool it was so I'll never miss that time no you ain't gonna get those days again Lee Shepard has still not forgiven Bob Glidden, who robbed him of the world title last year. Shepard, as you said, Charlie, the quickest qualifier here at the Cajun Nationals. But Pat Musi has upset potential. He has already been runner-up at two national events this year, and that's quite impressive, considering this is his first year of serious competition. On paper, this almost looks like a mismatch, as Lee Shepard in the near lane, fastest qualifier, and he qualified 16 one-hundredths of a second quicker than Pat Musi. Musi being very slow to move to the line here, putting a bit of pressure on Shepard, looking for every advantage he can get, even if it's just psychological. Musi's ready, Shepard's ready. Musi jumps, he's red-lighted, he went out too quick. Well, I'll say he went out too quick. He may have just closed his eyes and rolled the dice, but it comes up snake eyes as a red light glows back on the Christmas tree, meaning automatic disqualification for Pat Musi. You guys were on the ground floor of something special, and it's, it's really what you had already been doing. In 1977, the IHRA created, moved there away from the pounds per cubic inch, which you started in. They moved to the big motors, which was like ma uh, max mountain, race, motor. mountain <laughs> motor stuff. So tell me how that era played right into your wheelhouse. Well, I was a big block guy all along. So it, anybody that was a lot of them cars, pounds per inch or small blocks, although I ran a D-stroke big block and did really well with it, finished fourth in NHRA in 81, but later on, but it fell into my deal because I was a big buck guy. Now a 512 was a big motor. Can you imagine that? We're at 950. That's something I would never have dreamed of. 959 inches. I mean, it's just crazy. 512, we take, and another thing about that period, a lot of people don't get, we couldn't go to Dart and buy a set of cylinder heads. We couldn't go buy a block somewhere we had to go get a junkyard Corvette block or a 427 block, fill it up with concrete, bore it as big as we can bore it, put a crank in it, and then we had to get a set of Corvette heads, weld up the exhaust ports, put seats in them. I mean, everything we did, we had to redo. You know, it was factory stuff. There was no dart head. There was no... Uh, I mean, you had, we did have a Rodec block for a little while, and they were pretty good. We got up to like a 605, I think, after that. But then from there, it just escalated to what we have now. A lot of that stuff was trial and error. For, for instance, tires. We had Firestone slicks. Can you imagine? I think it was like a 1433 tire. And that was the first time I had tire shake. The door fell. It was the Monza. We made the first seven-second run in Englishtown. And the first run, it shook the door off. Richie Zool was, you know, Richie Zool. Old time pro stock guy, we were friends. He was helping me in English down that day. And he said, Well, maybe the drive shafts had a balance. I said, I don't know, it's a lot more than that. I don't know what the hell it was. <laughs> we kind of, you know, got a, somebody had, you know, seen the tire was all out of shape. And so I kind of just back in those days, we didn't know what to do. All, that was where a driver came in. I would just kind of like ease into the clutch and get it rolling and go, you know. But if you tried to get the clutch out, you know, like you wanted to make a run, we didn't have adjustable clutches. It, it was all trial and error. But we went that 795, I mean, they about fell out of the stands. I mean, that was unheard of when we did it, you know. So I was pretty cool that reaching that point. And y'all were basically testing for what you were going to run at the IHRA. At IHRA, exactly. Yeah. When. So, so on top of all this, trying this trial and error stuff then you got to figure out how to communicate with the likes of like Roy Hill and Ricky <laughs> Smith and all these guys so so tell me how equally tough it was to understand these guys got my first meeting with Roy Hill me and my old man so I had to figure out how to communicate with that guy we're from up north he's from down south down here and everybody said oh you gotta watch Roy you know he's tricky he's this he's that well we wound up having some words. I won't get into it, but we had some words. But we've been friends ever since. So Roy comes over, and he comes to the trailer, and he goes to my old man first. He says, I need to talk to you and your son. Pop says, yeah, sure. What do you want? He said, uh, well, you know, I kind of run things down here. My old man looked out. I'll never forget it. My old man was probably 50 years old, you know. 
He said, let me tell you something to Roy. He said, I'll have a whole jet land here from Newark within an hour if you touch my kid's car because I heard what you could do. We, Roy said, hold on a minute, that's all I'm here. <laughs> he said, I run this deal down here, but if we get together, we could rule this deal. <laughs> so we kind of made a pact. We kind of backed each other up. His deal was I run the north, he runs the south. If I had a problem down here, I'd call Roy. He had a problem up north, he'd call me. I swear, Bobby, we're best of friends since then. So it, and you know, most of your friendships, if you think about it, sometimes start out on the other side, you know, but I'll never forget that, you know. But then, so Roy was kind of the first one I, but if you could deal with Roy, Ricky Smith was an angel after that, and the rest of them were <laughs> angels. Not that they were hard to beat, I don't mean it that way, but Roy had it going on back then. There was no telling what he was going to do. Let's see if I can pick him out for you. That might be Warren. That is Warren. Yeah, look out. Man, Warren's putting hurt. Well, now well, you're coming on, up on around. Around. You must have hit that third system about yeah. then, right? Yeah. <laughs> they say, he's got to be cheating because I'm cheating and can't beat him. Yeah. So I kind of pro stock caught my eye in 74 and I got into that and did fairly well, you know, through the years, NHRA, IHRA. Um, but it became a budget thing. I just really concentrated on racing. All I wanted to do was race. I didn't give a damn if my car payments were behind or my shop payments were behind. So, you know, some of the other ones that, and, and I, I'll say it like this. I'll go out on a limb and tell you this way. So let's just pick a competitor that was racing when I was racing. You can go back and look. I don't have to mention the names. They got out of it because we would be, I, you look anywhere, I'd always be in the top of the pack. I'd always be competitive. They couldn't. But what they did that was smarter than me is went and paid attention to their engine building business. You know, a lot of them snuck around and seen what we were doing and that... That's when, you know, before, when I started, you had to build your own stuff. But then Rear started letting some of his stuff out. I would sell some of my stuff. And they're in the background concentrating on their engine business. We're concentrating on racing. And it just became a money thing where the pro stock deal just got out of hand. I mean, I couldn't do it anymore. So I kind of laid off that deal. And... Uh, I concentrated on my business. I built my business back up basically from scratch because, you know, racing will t take you to the poorhouse. Antonio over Bob Glidden. Our final matchup, a pair of Chevrolets. Lee Shepard in the far lane driving the Rare and Morrison special. While here on the tower side, it is Pat Busey. Both drivers taking their time getting into those staging beams. The Camaro of Lee Shepard moves forward. The starter signaling Pat Busey, they're ready and they're gone. It's anybody's race at this point. And Pat Busey begins to pull away and an upset as Pat Busey defeats the number two car in the world with an outstanding 8.44 second delay. Honestly, I didn't feel we got the respect as racers in IHRA that we should have because we had some good racers. And I kind of went out there to prove a point. It all happened kind of funny deal. Joe Fogor works at my shop, pro stock bike guy. One day and he says, uh, you think you could beat Bob Gooden if you had the right budget? I said, I think we put our pants on the same way. Yeah, I'm, I'm you know me, I was cocky. So that's how that started. We went to any train. All we heard was they're going to learn a lesson coming over here because they thought they were all at an any train. You know, with their little motors and their pounds per cubic inch. And so we built that. It was a 362-inch motor. Like I said, we finished fourth that year. I mean, I was probably the only time in Indy that every, anybody out-qualified Gooden or Shepard in NHRA in over two years. So we proved the point, you know, and we kind of brought some light. And then I think Ricky came in NHRA. A lot of them did, you know, I mean... For whatever reason, we just didn't get the media attention they got, you know, and they, they thought 
rear Mars and the sun rose and set in Arlington, Texas. That's all I can tell you. Well, it didn't. I showed them in India, it didn't. Now, did you get their respect because you came in as a boy? No, no, we, we, it was based on performance. I, I, I didn't, you know, I mean, I, I, I'll set the record straight. I'm only a bully if you come at me. Then be ready. But I'm not going to, I wasn't the type of person to bully any around. But don't start with me. I always say it like this. I'm not a good starter. I'm a good finisher. So, no, it wasn't about, that was just pure, we ran good. I mean, Jenkins come over, shook my hand. Glennon come over, rear pros tested me three times in that race. Uh, actually, Butch Leo was crewing with me that year. It was pretty funny, you know. He said, look, just go with it. We'll, t we'll talk crap when it's time to talk crap. And that's what we finished on the pole. We were number one qualifier that year. And see, GM was going to give the bow tie block out for the 500 inch deal. And it was going to be based on a lot of it of what they saw at Indy. So naturally, Rear didn't want a Chevrolet outrunning them. And when they got outrun, they weren't happy. That's all I can tell you. Did you get the respect from those guys towards the end of the season when you proved your work out there? You know, I hate to say it like this, but yeah, but I could tell you, Glidden was from the heart. Jenkins was from the heart. But to this day, I'll just, I like David Rear. We're good friends, but it wasn't from the heart. I know. I'm from Jersey. You will not get over on me. You could try. You can ask Roy. You're not going get, to get over on me. And that's just how I feel about it. You want the truth. You know, like I said, don't ask me if you don't want the answer. The pro street scene is one of the most explosive attractions in auto racing today. There are a few unique individuals that make the sport as exciting as it is. And Popeye Pat Musi and his crew have established a winning record in appearances all across the country. Pro Street. Why did Pro Street appeal to you? That was so far away from what you had done for years. Well, I'm going to tell you honestly. I'm sitting at my desk one day. And I keep reading about Tony Christian winning this, winning that, winning this. Looking at this deal. I see this Annette Summers, I don't know who she is, and uh, I looked at my guys, we were having like, you know, we'd call it shop talk at night, you know. I said, look, if Tony is winning this deal, we could go over there and take over that deal. And we rolled into St. Louis, Bobby, we did. Tony called me when he found out I was going to run it. You know, Tony was my reason, I swear. I knew Tony's capabilities, good racer, don't get me wrong, tough to beat. But I felt like I looked at what it would take budget-wise, had a partner, and I said, we could do that deal on a limited budget, you know, where the races were, the money they were paying. I mean, that, everybody thought we raced for nothing back then. Somebody made a comment. I corrected it on them. We had 50000 one year for the points, twenty five in the other one. I won, I think, 75000 one year. Tony won. We won a lot of money at it, so we were able to do that deal. I had a couple sponsors. I had that NEC deal. So I guess what I'm trying to say, I'm the kind of racer, I don't want to be cuffed by financial and get beat. You know, if I think I can do it, then I'll do it. And the pro stock deal became the Millionaire's Club. You couldn't do it. I mean, there's just no way. I mean, you look, I, I, I didn't even, I couldn't even tell you hardly who runs pro stock anymore. After Warren retired, I mean, I, I don't even know these kids, you know. But uh, I don't know if they could screw a spark plug in. Maybe I ought to ask them one day. Ask one of the drivers, hey, can you put a set of plugs in that thing? <laughs> the quickest car and the fastest car in NMCA, who was it? Bob Rieger. Okay. In NSCA, who was it? I would have been, believe me, if I was over there. Take that to the bank. You see, go over there and tell you how good his 650s run. No, no, I would have been. Who's the fastest real car, other than that hair dryer crap? Pat runs real good. I'm not going to take that away from him. Pat runs real good. Who's the most consistent? Can make it down the track, lap after lap after lap. Me. Period. Okay. <laughs> so let me ask you this: Was it Tony became a natural? Uh, rival because no class can have two equally proficient crap talkers 
Is that what it was? And that's what it was. You got you hit it on the head. That's exactly what it was. And you know, he drove me, I drove him, you know, it was a mutual deal, but Tony's a good racer. I wanted to beat him every time we went out, you know, and now if you hear Tony tell it, I never won, but I got eight world championships, so do the math. I had to win some races, wouldn't you think? But no, he was as good as we were, you know. I, he'll probably tell you that we're great friends now. We laugh about it, but uh, we would go at it. I mean, it was for real. We'd go at it. We'd try to run our heads off out there, but it, it was a good time. How close did you come to fight? Nah, I wouldn't fight Tony. I don't think I. I don't think he'd fight me. We 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 laugh about it, especially when it had his lung out. You know, we laugh about it. He said, Damn, I'll be out of breath. We start fighting. Don't start no fights. <laughs> when y'all were when y'all were at it, y'all y'all didn't ever come close to fighting. Nah, just words. I don't think we. I, I, it, it, it was bad, but not quite that bad, you know. But uh, he um, we went at it pretty good. I mean, at Rockingham. I got under his skin with that license plate I had. It was the first car to go over 200. And he wanted that license plate bugged him. And it wasn't doing jackal, nothing. I just put it on there because it aggravated him. <laughs> so he comes over, we're on camera, you know, it was on Horsepower TV. He said, you only went 200 because of that license plate. I went like 201 or something. I got the money was up from Borla. And, uh... I said, well, how much do you think that license plate's worth? It's worth at least two mile an hour because then it would have been 199 you got me? So I said, all right. I took the plate off on 204. <laughs> so, you know, but there were days where he'd get me. I'll tell you one he got me, boy. He was good at it, too. So we'd all put our spark plugs in the carburetor. You know, all eight plugs. And back then, we burned up stuff coming and going. It was... We called it learn why you burn plan nitrous in them days, you know. So if you had a tip off the plug, that was the first thing you looked for. So I looked at all my plugs. I said, we're good. Made a good run. Well, he run NGKs. I run NGKs at that time. I turned my back. He puts one of his burnt tip plugs in my deal. <laughs> and he goes, ah, you burned it up. I looked at that plug. I said, God damn, how'd I miss that? I'm get get the leak down, Tester. Get he started laughing, you know, but I was kind of he got me. So I can't help but think uh, when I hear the stuff about Annette Summer that you being the father of a female driver, if Lizzie would have been in Annette's place, how would you have treated her when she came in? Well, Annette was older, so it was a little different. And uh, we were trying to tell her, I tried to tell Annette, we need to put a show on. We're just, but look at it like show business, she didn't get it. She just started, she'd start crying or whining or, it was just one of them deals, you know, I couldn't get her to, Tony was way harder than I was on her. But uh, I don't know, it, it's just, I don't know, I don't know how to say it, you know, Lizzie, I mean, she, that was another thing that come out of the Pro Street deal. Lizzie and Trisha were seven and eight years old. They learned watching me. They knew how to stage their juniors from just watching me race. So they knew exactly how to do that. And then we couldn't wait to get them in a car and get rid of them damn juniors. Really neat deal, Brett Kepner. Meanwhile, we're ready to go. This is it, the Pro Street Finals. Pat Musi, the number one qualifier against this man, little Ricky Carlos out of Ontario, Canada. Well, this is a USA versus Canada match. The number one and two qualifiers, that's the way it's supposed to work. We started out with 16 Pro Street qualified cars. We're down to the final two, and it is the number one and two qualifiers. A pair of Camaros on the line. Pat Musi is a little late off the starting line. Ricky Carlos, a gate job. Musi may be in trouble. Pat Musi pulls out the whip there. 7-14, he almost lost that. How close was it? Take a look and judge for yourself. Let's go to Brad. As Pat Busey comes out of the Popeye Camaro, he can rest assured that he is number one in every single respect of NMCA racing this year, but I do need to tell you that you darn near lost that drag race. It was close. I was moving around in the white stuff, and I was worried he was coming, and he was ahead of me. I mean, yeah. probably to the eighth mile mark. 714 at 197. You didn't get the big 200, uh -huh. but uh, a 
should say that his two tenths hole shot made that only 35 thousandths of a second at the finish wow. line. I guess I wasn't doing my job on the starting line. Thank God I did my job under the hood, sir. And, and I'm willing to pay the consequences. Wait a minute, layout. sir. Let me hear what you did before you pay. Let me hear what you did. I told him, if you don't have my money, I'll take 480 out of your Jeep. You can fix your Jeep whenever you want to fix your Jeep. You don't have to worry about paying me. And we're even. And, and so that's what did exactly you do? what I did. I busted his Jeep up. With a bat? Yes, sir. How in heaven's name, if he owed you $488, did you expect to limit the damage that you did to his Jeep to $488? Were you being very well, careful where you hit it? Say, this will cost you $28. This will cost you $60. This will cost you $130. You didn't well, do that. I went over to one fender. I said, that's $240. I said, you that's got $240. $240. Really? You counted yeah. it up? He said, no. I said, <laughs> Tony's been in the body business for 30 years. You mean years. Tony was there saying, careful, yes, careful, was. it's over 240? Yes, he was. Is that what you said, Tony? <laughs> we, could, we kept good track of the damage. We kept good track of where yes. he was hitting and how much it was going to cost. It was either his, it? his vehicle, the Porsche, or the Explorer. I yes. see. So in other words, you, you were guiding him in his, in his uh, attack on no, the he vehicle? No, didn't need any guidance, Judge. He was doing... Well, what were you doing? Yelling out, that's 240! <laughs> Patrick! Hit the front light. That's only 120. Is that what you did? Huh? You understand? Does that make sense? Yes. You're a tough guy, aren't you? I, I'm tough when I gotta be. Let's put it that way. I don't back down from nobody. Everybody knows that. Have you ever lost a fight? Oh, yeah. Hell, yeah. We got jumped by... There was 15 of them and four of us, but we come back swinging. So all the, the we just feel the aura of manliness, manly man. Yeah, but now I'm old man. Now now I tell him I need to go get my baseball bat. I need some kind of equalizer. <laughs> I mean, it's only fair. I'm gonna be seventy. Yeah. So on the other flip side, what makes you emotional? Uh, watching Lizzie win, you know, and just winning a race or. We launched, remember Wapo's ashes out of our shoots, you know? Little stuff like that, you know, just get to you. What was it like the first time you saw her drive your race car? Uh, it was a little nerve wracking, you know, and I could critique all the things she was doing wrong, but you know what? She listens. I mean, the, the good thing I always say about Lizzie, I didn't get her with bad habits. Meaning, she didn't go to a school, not downplaying the schools. But I don't believe in them. I think that they get taught the way each school director wants them to drive. They, Lizzie drives. I honestly can say the last couple of years, I feel like I'm in the car working everything. I mean, we're so connected on the radio, so, I mean, she's become really good. I mean, she's able to jump from the street outlaw car to the pro mod car. That's pretty hard. I don't think I came along as a driver as fast as she did. But like I said, she listened. I gave her all my knowledge I could give her. When she did something wrong, she didn't argue with me, you know, and we became a good father and daughter team, I think. I want you to close your eyes for a second. And I want you to go back in time, close your eyes, and I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the emotions. You saw her win her first race and I want you to open your eyes and tell me about it. It was Virginia. I dropped to my knees. Just, it was killer. I mean, she won a, a PGRA national event, you know? So it was a big deal. I dropped right to my knees. Is there, is there something about a father seeing a daughter follow in his footsteps and be successful at it that you can't help but come to tears? No, you can't help that part of it. And knowing the teams we beat, how long they've been at it, their financing, you know, what they have. I mean, you got some hitters, Tommy Franklin. You got some hitters out there. Just a little shoot-off. We started doing this street outlaw deal. Everybody knows I was against it. But, Bobby, when you go to one of them races, it's like being back in the NMCA deals. The crowds... The TV, we had horsepower TV, now we got Discovery Channel. And I'm watching Lizzie grow up into that, you know, and she's got a lot of avenues she could go down. So, do I take heat for it? Yeah, a little bit.
It started, we had this guy, Joey, on our crew. He had this, like, hyena laugh, right? He just laughed. You could hear him. You could pick him out of the crowd. And he would. He got Lapone on, at Indy on a starting line, deep pants. We called deep pants in back in those days. He'd run up behind you and jerk your drunk work. He got Gene Fulton in Puerto Rico. Do you remember that? Right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so Joey was kind of known for that. And we're all, we're up top. It's Ricky and his crew, Roy and his crew, my and my crew. We we're all had big guys with us. There was a, there was 10 football players, let's say. So Roy's getting bored. He wants something to do. That's how it always usually start. Roy get bored. So he looks over and right at the bar, this guy's kind of like, got his elbow on a bar. He's drinking and he got this little damn shorts on in a bar with guys. I mean, come on, man. So Roy says to Joey, he says, Go pull that guy's pants down, Joey. <laughs> Joey says, all right. So we see him go over there. He walks over. He gets up. Bam. Down to his knees. Guy gets up, wants to jump on Joey. As he got up, all of us got up. The whole, my table, the, your table. The whole deal was, don't worry, Joey. We'll take care of you. Right. We got you. So we jump up. So he looks up. He's, he looks and he says, oh, okay, that was funny. That's how I, he regrouped, you know, attitude. to be remembered by in drag racing as a guy that started at 16 years old as a street racer, built a business, and then trained the driver. I think I've accomplished everything you could accomplish. I've earned the respect of manufacturers. And I think I innovated a lot of things. I mean, the fuel injection, I mean, they, they laughed at me when I came out with it. They ain't laughing now, I don't think. Now, you might have all these gurus, computer geeks, but that don't equate to making power and getting it on the racetrack, but. Pat Musi, that is the nitrous machine. Brad Personat with the big speed car is in the right lane. with the big advantage at the starting line. All the mind power, no, all the mind power out the world. I, I still say it, I could be cocky or whatever, but everybody knows it. I made everybody go to fuel injection. Let's be honest about it. First EFI car to win. I mean, there was one other car, I won't mention names, but, you know, he never done anything with it. Never, you know, really never brought it to where it is now today, you know, but. Uh, so that was a great accomplishment. Winning that race. A scary moment though, as the racing community came together, watched the car in the left lane, the far side of your screen. This is Pat Musi. He had a bad accident, Mike. Yes, he did. You see at the finish line, didn't get the shoots out. And then when he hit the brakes, the car just swerved to the right and hard contact in the right side guard wall. So I break my back in 2010. They said, well, you're gonna need a year to rehab. I said, you ain't got a year, you got 10 months. What do you mean? I said, I got to test the brain in 10 months. I said, I'm, you said 12, you got 10. So I went there in nine and a half months to get cleared. And he said, well, I think you should wait that extra couple of months. I said, well, you got anything wrong you could see? Because I was lifting weights. I was doing, I was so hard headed. I had, I ran all 2012, finished second in the AGRO points. I proved the point. Then I was able to step out of the car. I was not gonna end it on. I broke my back and I can't drive because I'll jump in a car any given time. 